December 7, 1941, the Japanese unleash a devastating attack against Pearl Harbor, dealing a painful blow to the Pacific Fleet. More than 2,000 American servicemen perish while attempting to repel the onslaught. And although the attack fails to knock out the strategically important aircraft carriers, it succeeds in shaking the American people to the core. Entering the war is no longer a choice. It is a necessity. On December 11, Nazi Germany declares war against the United States. Just a few days later, Operation Paukenschlag is put in motion by the commander of U-boats, Karl Dinitz. This long-range operation is an attempt to cripple the U.S. merchant fleet, which holds a key role in supplying Great Britain in its struggle against Hitler. All along the U.S. East Coast, German U-boats sink hundreds of American tankers and cargo ships, slowly tightening the noose around the neck of Great Britain. It is clear that without American support to their war effort, Britain's survival will be measured not in months, but in weeks. With a majority of its might focused on fighting the Japanese in the Pacific, the U.S. Navy is left with very few anti-submarine vessels available for the Atlantic theater, not even remotely enough to introduce an efficient convoy system that could protect a merchant fleet from the U-boats. The bloodbath continues for months, and the fire from burning tankers becomes a common sight from the shores of the East Coast. The survival of Great Britain now hangs by a thread. Finally, in May 1942, the U.S. Navy manages to muster enough anti-submarine ships to put the convoy system into effect. Now, with the help of the Royal Canadian Navy, merchant ships are escorted along the U.S. coast to form convoys around Newfoundland. Only then are they ready, having been joined by their guardian angels, to set out on the perilous journey across the Atlantic. At last, the Steel Wolves of Dennett's will be facing a challenge. They are about to meet a whole new breed of enemy fast, maneuverable, and more than capable of sending a submarine to the bottom. The Fletcher-class Destroyer. The Battle of the Atlantic took place in the 1940s. During that time, most U-boats were still diesel electric and so could not stay submerged for prolonged periods of time. Therefore, you're very likely to detect them on the surface using radar before they close in for the attack. Once a U-boat submerges, you can no longer detect it using radar, and you will have to use sonar instead. Unlike radar, the sonar of the 1940s had to be pointed in the appropriate direction in order to detect the enemy. Bear that in mind when you lose radar contact with the enemy, and most importantly, remember this. Radar works only for surfaced contacts, while sonar works only for submerged contacts. Last but not least, the 1940 sonar also has a dead zone right under your destroyer, which is crucial to remember. The most important thing you need to understand, however, is that everything at sea is ruled by the compass. Consequently, every instrument, report, and command also refers to it. It works just like the clock, with 000 or 360 at the top, 090 on the right, 180 at the bottom, and 270 on the left. These three-digit codes are called bearings, and they refer to the cardinal points. 000, or 360, is the north. 090 is the east. 180 is the south. And 270 is the west. So, if there is a contact at bearing 090, it means that it is located east of our position. This system allows the crew to quickly exchange information regarding where the enemy has been detected, what course to take, and so on. Once you understand it, it quickly becomes second nature. In summary, the most important information for you will always be the position of the currently tracked enemy, which is given in bearings, which direction, and ranges how far away from your position. The last thing you need to know is how to execute a successful depth charge attack. The problem consists in hitting a moving object in 3D space with a weapon that has a considerable delay between being fired and hitting the target. In general, the attack has to be made in such a way as to drop the depth charges with a lead ahead of the U-boat's bow.
What is more, the depth charge fuse must be set for shallow, medium, or deep. Bear in mind that the deeper you set the fuse, the longer it takes the depth charges to reach the set depth. The optimal time to drop depth charges is calculated by an analog computer called the Tactical Range Recorder. It measures the speed of closing the distance between your destroyer and the target, and will help you to decide when to give the order to fire. Because of that, pay close attention to what the tutorial says about using the TRR, as it will make the difference between success and failure. In reality, the chances of hitting a U-boat with depth charges were rather slim, but due to the devastating effects that even close misses had on the submarine's morale, harassing and suppressing the U-boat was often enough to make its crew abandon further attack attempts, at least for some time. Now that you understand the most essential facts about anti-submarine warfare in the Second World War, you can proceed with the tutorial.